sink all over himself. Uh, how to outsmart a machine, which really sounds like a Star Trek episode. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a pitch. Yeah, you know, a lot of this is going on right now. A lot of people are losing their jobs. And, uh, I just was hearing on the radio that people are uh, getting this new kind of depression where they hate their, the person they have to work next to is a machine and they, they don't know what to do with it because it doesn't respond to their nature. I mean, it's really, it's really getting pretty weird. But it's not like we didn't expect this. So Kyle Pollock is going to tell you about how to outsmart a machine and uh, why you still can. So here it is, Kyle Pollock. outsmart a machine, at least why you still can. Um, some of you will recognize this as the Mechanical Turk, one of the oldest machines that at least claimed to be able to outsmart human beings. It was a supposed automated chess player, um, although what you can't see is underneath this mechanism here was a way for a guy to fit in there and somehow control the pieces. Um, so still an interesting feat of engineering, just not the one that they claimed it to be doing as it toured around. Turns out it took couple hundred more years till what, 97, when Deep Blue finally beat Kasparov, and uh, machines are now the far and wide champions of the game of chess. Um, somewhere a little bit more contemporary, a program named Eliza was written. And actually, you should be skeptical of most things you hear about Eliza, it's been a little bit exaggerated. But I'll read you, it purported to be like a uh, psychotherapist or a psychologist or whatever the case may be as a chat interface. So Eliza would say something like, is something troubling you? It's like an appropriate opening line for a psychologist, to which you might say, oh, men are all alike. And Eliza could respond, what's the connection do you suppose? Which you might type back to, they're always bugging us about something or other, to which Eliza might say, can you think of a specific example? And if we were to go on and on with this, you'd find Eliza saying stuff like, tell me more about that. How does this relate to your childhood? or any number of kind of vagaries and keyword replacements that uh, can hold up for a time the illusion that maybe this thing is a person on the other end attempting to help you with a therapy context. And if you get therapy from this, that's great. Go ahead and talk to Eliza. Uh, but that would be a truly surprising feat if you got long-term value from a system like that. Um, it doesn't do much learning. But of course, as many people know, machine learning is a major topic. And, industry and research and things like that. And there are many ways to do machine learning. Uh, one that I have some familiar, familiarity with is called tree-based approaches. So I think everyone will recognize this as a tree. Uh, the roots on the top, we do things different in computer science. Um, the root would be some question like, uh, I don't know, how many miles per gallon does your car get? And the low, medium, and high. And then you'd have other follow-up questions leading you to some leaf, which would be either a prediction, or a, you know, what is your car worth, or something like that. Um, to give you a little bit more concreteness here, oh, my lines are showing up a little slowly, but appearing. That's kind of cool. Um, <laughs> some facts, a couple of choices. Um, and then notice, depending on what value I've chosen for A, B, or C, we're going to potentially look at different facts, which may appear in other places. Um, each possible transit through this is one classification you might do with machine learning towards some system in which you're either offering somebody something or not offering them something, be it a job, an apartment, a date, could be just about anything because it's all math behind the scenes. Um, now, what if we wanted to fool this machine learning attempt? Um, this is something that's presumably we want the offer, or if, if you don't want the offer, flip it and uh, go for the red squares. There are paths if we knew how this model works. So we want to get an offer. Uh, we can follow this path, follow this path, and this one. So if you understand what the system is looking for, and you can fool it on some of these basic facts, you might even be able to figure out, hey, the only important fact that I need to change is fact two. I would have ended up in the red here. If I can trick the machine into thinking that I, on this path, I already matched for this one, and uh, I'm home free into the offering. <coughs> um, this is a little bit like manipulating your FICO score. I have a credit card in a drawer for over a decade now because I had a squamish with an anchorage against that company. 
but I have a long credit history with them. So rather than closing an account like a normal person, I leave it open to trick the FICO algorithm slightly. Um, human beings have been fooled for a long time, not just by magicians and uh, performers. Uh, if you haven't seen this Richard Wiseman video, you should definitely check that out. I won't support the punchline, but yeah, uh, it thank fooled you. me, and on average, I guess about 50% of people yeah. are fooled by this video. Um, I, I think everyone in this room will admit you've been fooled at least once, maybe today. Um, <laughs> that's no surprise. Here's a fun one. Uh, not quite fooling you, but a trick of the mind, right? Can you see two different animals here? Yeah. yeah. One actual animal and one implied animal, which is actually there. You can see it. Um, this is more the realm of what I'll get into a bit today of how we're going to fool machines, because this is kind of the state of the art of how we can trick a lot of machines. Um, but just to go back and talk about kind of a gray area, everyone's familiar with that little spam folder in your inbox. Every email program seems to have this nowadays. I remember a time before that was common, and spam was uh, much more than a nuisance. I think in the late 90s, early 2000s, before a lot of the technology had developed, I was getting inundated with spam, and I don't think I was the only one. Uh, a lot of that changed thanks to machine learning. We found really good algorithms that, found, that solved this problem. Uh, the problem being, here's an email, tell me if it's spam or not spam. It's a simple choice, uh, maybe not the flip of a coin, but one the machines were able to figure out quite elegantly. Um, they've done a lot of other really interesting and elegant stuff over the last decade or so. So let's talk about things that absolutely did not work in 2010, even though some of them were on the market and stuff like that. Facial recognition simply just didn't work. Uh, automated or uh, optical character recognition kind of worked. Uh, image captioning not at all. Uh, AlphaGo, which was sort of a not a direct predecessor, but a, a long, next in a long line of machines beating humans and ever difficult challenges. I mentioned Gary Kasparov earlier we losing at chess to uh, Deep Blue. When I was in grad school, Go, the game of Go was supposedly the unbeatable game that machines would never master until they did a few years ago. Uh, and AlphaGo trounced the world's uh, leading uh, Go player. We now have no more games that uh, we are better at than computers. They've beaten us at everything. Uh, we actually need to start inventing new games if we want to have any competitions between humans and computers. Um, Humans also, we saw a number of milestones in the last few years where machines are at human or often better level of medical diagnostic, meaning that for every 10,000 images, people will make much more mistakes than a computer will. It will see things at or above the clarity doctors will on certain tests. There's a famous AI guy named Jeff Hitton who a few years ago rather crassly said, look, in five years, the machines are going to be better than the radiologists. It takes five years to train as a radiologist, we should stop training them now. <laughs> and he was more or less correct. Um, we, of course, need people to double check the work of the machine, and there's a whole talk in and of that, but without a doubt, this thing that in 2010 I would have been fairly skeptical of is a reality today. Some of the things that sort of work, uh, that maybe will be on the other side of the column if I do a talk like this in 10 years, deep fakes that we'll talk more about. Uh, if you haven't seen this, it's a good moment to Google a little bit and see what a deep fake is, although I'll get to that. Um, we have, maybe I should have put convincing in, in quotes, because uh, teach their own, but convincing movie and film likenesses, you know, bringing people back. Uh, Carrie Fisher famously appeared in some of the new Star Wars movies as a uh, simulacrum of herself. Um, this is what I'm kind of personally calling out automated music and sound effects. There is no reason this shouldn't exist today. I don't know why a company hasn't created this, that there's just a video playing and all of the Foley art, you know, the stomping of feet, the water, and the music, all of that could very easily be generated automatically today. Uh, Self-driving cars, not quite there, but we're getting closer. Um, I think there'll be a pharmaceutical revolution in the near future. Uh, sort of, I have some reasons to back that up that weren't not worth getting into, but a lot of research headed in that direction. And lastly, something that uh, I'll spend some time on in future slides, these things we call pre-trained learning models, uh, in particular one called BERT, that's pretty famous, and I get back to those. Um, so it's a big list of stuff that seems pretty disconnected, I would imagine. You know, what does facial recognition have to do with the game of Go, and what does that have to do with pharmaceuticals? Well, there is one common thing that all of these applications do have in common. It looks like this. It's called deep learning. It's a somewhat old, somewhat new approach to how to do machine learning. Uh, basic idea being, put in as much data as you can, that's the new part.
part, because we have fast, cheap computers now, and hope for the best, that they can learn something. Um, each of these nodes represents kind of one single calculation, and there'll be lots more that I can fit on one screen here, which is what my little ellipses are meant to imply. Um, so let's take a step back and talk about how machine learning used to work. It still works this way, but a simpler version than the deep learning stuff. What if you want to predict the price of a home? Well, the value of the home is some combination of factors, right? So let's get creative. Every home has some base price above zero. Uh, the number of bedrooms affects it, the number of baths. This is a very short list, could go on and on with different features you might be able to identify about a house. Um, they don't even have to be good features, they just have to be plausibly good features that you can generate a data set of and then give it to a machine learning algorithm and say, all these places I put in uh, variables, B1 through B5, or this base price, you go figure out what those numbers should be. Um, and more or less the machine does it this way, it says, okay, well, Whatever number you give me, some number of bedrooms between zero and, I don't know, 10 or something like that, multiply that by some number, and then number of bathrooms multiplied by a different number, add them all up, that's the value of the home, okay? All I have to do is find the best possible values I can find for all those things starting with these. Very simple math problem that computers are exceptionally good at. Um, you can also take that a step further. This is where we head towards deep learning. It's easy to come up with a solution. Oh, and by the way, I think everyone in here could make up their own numbers, like what's the base price of a house? I don't know, depending on your area, 100 grand, yeah. every bedroom is worth. Yeah, that's <laughs> true. <laughs> 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 Bedrooms might be worth 100 grand, uh, Palo Alto, uh, so on and so forth. Well, but everyone could right. come up with numbers here, and, and we can kind of debate about them. Some of us would have better than numbers than others, maybe people in Realty, uh, a realtor in the room, or something like that. But at the end of the day, there is a best set of numbers. And given enough data, the machine will find it. That's pretty uncontroversial. But what if you take that from this kind of simple thing that I imagine every people kind of sort of get, and say, well, let's throw in a new level to it. Let's give it the raw data, but then introduce these ideas called hidden layers, where you say, not only do you, the computer, need to figure out what these variables are, but also there's some variables I don't even know what they're for, but they're there, go, go figure them out. Um, and if you can do that with two layers, uh, computers scale up. Do it with three layers, four layers. Uh, I couldn't even, most of the things I do at work are about 19 layers deep. Um, all of which is just to say I feed in a structure like this, a very kind of what would be a pretty graph if it were graphed out. I give it some data and I tell the computer, you go figure it out. And just the way it's not surprising a computer could figure out decent values and home prices, give it examples. The very same exact technology is what we use to figure out if there's a face in an image and whose face that is, and all these sorts of things. It's all the same math, just scaled up. We call it a neural network. Uh, this is a neuron. There's no actual resemblance to the notion of a neural network. Great <laughs> misnomer. Um, but if I want to push the limit, I would say that you know, the incoming data to the cell are like those first, you know, so I've kind of color-coded it to match mine. And then the output of the axon is these blue hidden layers that then connect to other axons. So in a way that's certainly inspired by, but also not really at all the same thing as the brain, uh, you give it this enough computing power, it'll do some pretty profound things. Um, so given the values, uh, if the, we went through some machine learning process and we knew all the P values and the base price, what could we do with that? Well, given those values, we can use arithmetic to estimate the value of a home. Um, and if your values, if your model's good, uh, like the company, I guess Zillow has their Zestimate, which is maybe not perfect, but pretty good. Um, they've done an exercise like this. They're able to predict the price of new homes. Okay, well, how can we flip that on its head and manipulate this? <coughs> well, if you want to fool the machine, we already know, if we know the values and we know how it works, we can decide to use algebra to figure out how to manipulate the inputs to get the output we're looking for. So, um, if it were as simple as it dumbly looks at the number of bedrooms and your local uh, inspector would allow it, just cut all your bedrooms in half and suddenly the value of your home has magically gone up from the algorithm's perspective. Although I do have some total square footage stuff in here, so if the person who created this was clever, they've figured out some ways to avoid those corner cases, but machine learning really learns on the cases you give it, not the cases it hasn't seen before. Um, all that was until somewhat recently, uh, when a lot of these pre-trained language models have come out. So, one of the dirty secrets about these really impressive technologies that are using this kind of stuff is that 
they cost a great deal of money to train, and they cost, uh, they require a huge amount of data to even process. Uh, one that made the news is a model called GPT-2 from uh, OpenAI Institute. They, uh, I think the estimate is they spent $45,000 to train the model. Uh, the purpose of this model being a general language model, language understanding. So, I'll uh, give you the example here. They gave the system a prompt. They said, all right, the beginning of a news article is, in a shocking findings, finding scientists discover a herd of unicorns living in a remote, previously in Exploit Valley in the Andes Mountains. Even more surprising to the researchers was the fact that the unicorn spoke previous English. Okay. Perfect. Perfect English. Then they went to the pre-trained language model, this $45,000 thing trained on Wikipedia and Reddit data and stuff like that, <laughs> and said, what do you imagine might come next in the sentence? To which the model replied, the scientists named the population after the distinctive horn, Ovid's unicorn, these four horns, silver white unicorns were previously known to science, it goes on to even invent a hypothetical doctor and tells part of the story. Wow. Um, and obviously fictional, but uh, not fictional in the computer sense. Uh, no one, I would imagine, would five years ago have guessed a computer wrote this. Certainly uh, it's, it's fake, but uh, another interesting thing to point out is, hidden in parentheses over here, the machine written took 10 tries. What does that mean? That means somebody gave it this input and said, what do you think should come next? and hit refresh nine times until they got this story. So it is a bit cherry-picked. Although, for the record, I went and used the system myself, as you guys can too. There's a site called talktotransformer.com. I gave it the prompt Data Skeptic, uh, my podcast, and said, what do you think should come next? And what came back is this thing that looks like, I don't know, an email, and much to my surprise and delight, a reply to a letter from Dr. James Randi, part eight. Oh. Uh, so this BERT pre-trained language model off the name Data Skeptic alone said, seems like whatever comes next might involve Randy. Let's stick him Oh, out. that's great. Nobody put Randy into the system. So well, somebody put him in Wikipedia, and this system found him all over the place there. I don't know how much credit Susan can take for Randy, but <laughs> that's really uh, certainly some. And uh, like I said, these language models, though expensive and difficult to train, now it's done. You can go to this website, or I've downloaded them, uh, a similar model myself that I use to do these sorts of inferences. Um, so what has happened is a technology that was previously only available in an elite sort of way, took a lot of money and a lot of smarts, has now been very democratized. Um, well, let's talk about how we fool systems like that a bit more. This is kind of a famous kickoff to a whole line of research called the Fooling Images. As I imagine most of you guys have taken notice of, machine learning has gotten really good at captioning. So the fact that you could give it this image and it would say, oh, that's a panda. The only thing surprising about that is it's only 57% confident, which shows you that this, pa this paper is a few years old. That would be much higher today. Um, but what if, what if we wanted to fool the machine and, say, and get it to, to look at a photo or one like this and not call it a panda, instead say, I think that's a gibbon. And uh, I'm not actually sure what a given is, but I bet if I had a phone <laughs> one, it wouldn't look anything like a panda. Well, the, I don't think this fooled anyone in this room. Pretty much everyone knows that's a panda. Why did it fool the machine? Well, because um, they took this image, which looks like noise and nonsense to our eyes, and they lightly masked it over here at a very small transparency, 0 0.007, so our eyes can't see it. But machines don't have hours like I, our, do not have eyes like ours, they have um, inputs, basically. So this image is converted to pixel values, and those pixel values are analyzed. And much the way I was able to you know, explain to you the arithmetic here and say, well, if we can fake it out, make you think you're in the wrong district, uh, get a better school rating, your home will be valued more, there are ways you can scale up that approach. What would it take in terms of the most minor of adjustments possible to this image to make the computer make a mistake, that, and specifically one that a human wouldn't make. Now some criticism came around for things like this, that this was too simple and noisy, you can't make you know, interesting looking images, to which other researchers said, yes we can. Uh, this is hard to read, but like uh, I think this one is called HAL 9000, uh, one of these is called Bagel and Apple, and in fact, with those captions, uh, these were entered and entered in and won an art contest, actually. So machines are now beating humans in art as well. Um, but if I've lost you a little bit, let me just take a step back and just explain the basics of machine learning. It's like an optometrist visit. Better like this or better like this? 
Okay? Better like this or better like this? Panda or Gibbon? Okay? Panda or Gibbon like? <laughs> Keep turning those knobs until it's, I don't know what's a Gibbon. And that's basically how machine learning works. Um, this fooling images stuff started as a bit of, you know, maybe fun in the literature, but has now escaped into the real world. Uh, stop signs are being uh, attacked in this adversarial way, such that maybe a self-driving car might not be able to recognize that as a stop oh. sign. Um, here's a person correctly identified as person. Uh, exploring the idea of fooling images, he took one of those uh, noisy images and held it with him on some sort of, or maybe it was pasted on top. Didn't fool the machine, still a person. However, then they put this kind of weird image on top of them, and that was enough to fool the machine. Didn't even require the process I described, just a lot of finagling to get that to happen. Um, so through all this complexity, stuff that oftentimes the researchers themselves can't totally tell you how or why it works, you get some label out. And if it works reliably, we trust it. Anybody recognize any of these people? Yeah. yeah. I was looking for no, because these are all fake people. All what? Uh, these are all generated via a process called oh, GANs, Generative the Adversarial intro. Networks. I know I'm running a little short on time and can't really give you a graduate course in this, so let me give you a quick <laughs> sense of how this works. There are two components to a GAN. A discriminator, whose instruction is, look at what we show you and do your best to know what's real or fake. And then its adversary, the generator, whose job is to trick the discriminator. And if you give these powerful algorithms enough time and enough compute cycles to attack each other millions of times a second, they'll start coming up with images like this, where, is it a dog or not? Uh, or even more close ones than that, like uh, some of the, these faces, for example. Perhaps why it, some of them look like real celebrities to use because they were trained on data sets, so there's elements of, you know, this could be, I don't know, so-and-so's two kids or something like that. But, um, Here's a great, anybody remember this band? Aerosmith? No, not actually a band. Uh, this is what happened when you asked a general, generative neural network, uh, sorry, again, to try and come up with a t-shirt that looks like a classic rock t-shirt. <laughs> that looks like Aerosmith at first. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, and something I think is coming for us in the near future, uh, the fake headline here, a revered dentist claims that the latest uh, Paul McCartney song is a fake song. It's not actually him. It's all computer generated his voice and everything. And Paul will have to come out and say, no, I'm still not dead, and that is my song. my <laughs> royalties. <laughs> and that might be interesting for us skeptics for a minute. Uh, less interesting, but still possible, a software could imagine impossible collaborations, like uh, John Lennon and Lady Gaga coming up with a song together, uh, in the style of John Lennon, with John Lennon's voice contributing harmonies. These are feasible things that are coming. Um, so deep fakes. 100%. <laughs> technology using a lot of this, these GANs and things like that to produce videos that appear to be real while in fact being fake. And these are profoundly successful. A lot of the demonstrations are done uh, for the purpose of being demonstrations, you know, like uh, there's a lot of good ones that this kind of came out when I think Obama was still in office, and they think him saying ridiculous things like, you know, we're going to invade uh, countries like that wouldn't make sense and stuff like that. Uh, stuff that I don't know, maybe Trump might say, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, point is, we can't trust video anymore. Seeing is no longer believing. So naturally, we don't give up hope. Uh, a lot of computer science type people, machine learning people, are looking for ways of how can we detect them. I interviewed one researcher on Data Skeptic who had an interesting technique. He noticed that in all the deep fake videos, the people were never blinking. And of course, the average human being doesn't go for too long without blinking, so they build a blink detector, which doubled as a deep fake detector. Until two weeks later, when some deep fake people made their algorithm start putting blinks in. Um, there was another technique where if you have a good enough video, you can expand the color range uh, to such an extreme, very distorted to our eyes, but you can actually see uh, blood pressure in people's faces ever so slightly. And deep learning algorithms didn't do that on their own. So I said, oh, well, let's look for that blood pressure with sensitive cameras. And so we just realized, let's just make fakes that do the same thing. Um, part of my point with the John Lennon thing is to say that, you know, or well, Paul McCartney really, he could go out and make a new song tomorrow if he wanted to and release it. He's alive and, and performing and all that. Um, and he could also give up performing tomorrow afternoon and a new song could still come out. How would we know which one is real? He is capable of making the new music in a way that John Lennon is not, for obvious reasons. 
Um, a lot of this deep fake stuff, we're getting to the point where since an image can exist, since Paul could go write a new song, uh, there's no way of saying for sure it's a fake because those bits could exist. That song could have been real. Uh, if it's possible for a human to have done it, it's certainly possible for a machine to one day do it. So, how do we fight back in the few little time I have left? Um, some of you will recognize this as a classic scene from 2001 in which they go into a supposedly private area to get away from Cal, who can still see them and begins reading their lips to find out their ultimate plan. So an interesting novelty that uh, uh, presumably they should have known that the machine could read lips, but regardless, how would you know it, had, uh, it was doing that? It certainly has autonomy, it's a complex system. You could have microphones and cameras that turn on and off, and certainly there's some safety components to that, but at the end of the day, energy was consumed in that lip reading process. And even if you have no access to a computer's operating system, you can always vampire clip the power outlet that goes into its wall, because the one way in which machines are quite fragile is that you can unplug them at any time. Not at all. So, humans versus machines. A lot of people go back to Asimov's laws. I'm running out of time, so I won't tell you why these are wonderful for storytelling, but impractical in practice. A um, couple other failed strategies. Logic tricks, uh, like the famous Doctor Who scene, in which you know, ask one robot to tell what the other robot will say, or the plot of war games, ask the computer to solve an unsolvable problem. Uh, the one that is real is computers have something called the halting problem. It's fundamental computer science. It is a thing that computers absolutely cannot do. I don't know how we exploit it, but it exists. Um, it's the only Achilles heel I'm aware of the machine, or, or things variants on that. So, how can we fool a machine? First and foremost, we can leverage traceability, simulation, and containerization. If I ask you to do some job interviews and decide who to hire, I can ask you for a report on why you picked the person you picked, and maybe you'll give me an honest answer, maybe you'll give me an honest uh, answer you intended to be honest, or maybe there's bias there. If I use software to do that, at the end of the day, that software can be audited. Someone can trace it through, look at the state of the variables and everything about it. So even if uh, the algorithm does something awful. You can confirm it did the awful thing, why it did it, and come up with ways to prevent it in the future. Um, computational barriers, the best one being encryption. AI may be powerful, it will not be magic. And there are certain limits, encryption being one of them, where uh, you cannot simply magically learn how to decrypt something. It is a known hard problem. So if you don't want machines reading things, uh, encrypt them. Uh, attack the model directly using some of those techniques I was showing you earlier about like a panda is a gibbon. Um, exploit the fact that most machine learning uses what's called offline learning. You take a bunch of data and you train a model and then once the model is ready you just start using it. Uh, and this is what I do most of the time professionally. You know, I'll develop some system that looks at business data, makes a choice and you know, send an offer, don't send an offer and that runs forever. The case where I don't do this is in fraud detection where as soon as I up my game, someone else ups their game. Um, but as long as there's nothing too adversarial there, most machine learning is done offline and then like frozen in place, whereas we are dynamic. Um, the other thing is to uh, create tasks which incentivize good behavior. Um, if there are things that we're worried about computers doing, uh, they're really rule followers and pretty good at that. So why not just set up systems where it benefits them to do what you want? That's more or less what most machine learning is anyways. And lastly, uh, machine versus, versus machine is very much a, a viable option here. I don't know that we'll ever get to cyber warfare, but uh, the next war will probably be one that is, if it's not entirely an information war, it'll be certainly a large part of it. And if we're the victim of attacks of a machine learning nature, we'll have our own machines to participate in that as well. So, not necessarily a complete list, but to the best of my knowledge, these are the remaining ways we know how to fool machines um, while they're working very hard at fooling us and getting better and better at it all the time. So, stay skeptical, and for the second time today, uh, not on purpose, we'll quote Feynman who said, Science is what we have learned about, uh, sorry, science is what we have learned about how to keep, our, keep from fooling ourselves. And uh, I guess those words will always be true because no matter how good the technology gets, when we reach that point where we can say video is no longer trusted because bits are bits and they can be faked, um, there's still empirical processes, there's still the scientific method, there's still uh, the types of techniques that the IIG and the uh, James Randi test would do to say, okay, if we don't know how your power works, but we can develop tests for it. And I think certainly that will become more and more part of the flow because there is no turning around the ship on the ability for machines to fool us. 
Uh, we have some ability remaining to fool them, and it's definitely going to be an interesting future. So thanks for listening.